Okay. Hopefully this recording. So let's go share screen. Go digest it and we'll pick up where we left off. Okay. Uh, this is pretty much where we were. Um, so just don't forget, um, these are molars. These are premolars or bicuspids. That's a cuspid. You can also call it a canine. And these are incisors. That's about all I'm going to ask you. Not numbers of the teeth or when they come in or erupt or anything like that. Just know you got 32 adult teeth, 20 baby teeth or deciduous teeth. So the incisors are for incising through something like meat or, or an apple. Um, premolars are kind of a combination of, you know, they're kind of a mix between incisors and molars, and molars are more for grinding, like for grains and bread and stuff like that. Um, all righty. So don't forget 20 baby teeth, 32 adult teeth. That's normal. Sometimes you get a more, sometimes a couple or less, you know, there can be missing teeth. There can be what they call supernumerary or extra teeth. Um, but yeah, if I ask you on the test, just 32 adult teeth, 20 baby teeth. All right, we did the epiglottis last time when we talked about uh, respiratory. The esophagus, so that's the uh, first part of the, um, part of the upper part of the digestive uh, tube, you know, the alimentary canal. So um, it's got stratified squamous inside of it, remember? Um, and it's kind of weird. It's got the two layers of muscle, the tunica muscularis externa, you know, around it. But the top one third of that esophagus is actually skeletal muscle up there. And then it transitions into smooth as you go down there. So it looks kind of weird on the, on the slides compared to the rest of the digestive uh, system. Has a tunica adventitia, not a tunica serosa. We talked about that. So this would be the esophagus inside of here would be stratified squamous. So that's more for mechanical protection. You get down in the stomach, then it's simple columnar. So you still got the same four layers. You got the tunica mucosa on the inside and under that, but you know, you're going towards the outside. The submucosa, then the tunica muscularis externa, that's this. Don't forget the stomach has three subdivisions. It's got the inner circular, the outer longitudinal, and even inside of the inner circular, you have these little obliques, um, these oblique uh, muscle layer. You know, it's just like little strips. Just gives the stomach a little more grinding power. So don't forget the, um, oh, just the big stuff. This curvature up at the top, this bulge out part is called the fundus generic word, the uterus has a fundus also. This is the greater curvature. This is the lesser curvature, okay? These little uh, folds inside of here are called rugae, R-U-G-A-E. Hmm? This is the pyloric region with the pyloric sphincter. This is the cardia region with the cardiac sphincter. And so when this is full of food, then this these two sphincters kind of close off and then let all this grind and do all of its thing. Uh, you know, there's acid in there. And so basically this mixture, as it becomes more and more liquefied, they call it chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. And then that will go out this away a little bit at a time so it can be neutralized and then uh, nutrients absorbed from that. Um, okay, so. Let's keep going. So now you're looking close up. So this is stomach, but it has what they call gastric pits. So see this little opening here? They're, they're fairly large. Maybe with a good magnifying glass, you could see them. Um, so those pits go down into gastric glands. You can see these on the microscope. Um, and so in the glands, Pay attention to chief cells and parietal cells. We're not going to do G cells on this. Uh, since it's anatomy, you'll get all that in physiology, but we will go a little bit over chief and parietal and what they make. Um, so anyway, if you look at this artist's drawing, um, it still has the four layers. So there's your, there's your little muscularis mucosa, by the way, that little strip of muscle. Everything from there towards the lumen, that's your uh, 
tunica mucosa. This is the submucosa, and here's your muscle layer, tunica muscularis externa, and then you have your tunica serosa. Okay. Now, small intestines. Uh, most of the absorption, this is kind of written poorly, but most of the absorption is done in your uh, small intestines. And say maybe 90% of it. But of that, most of that is done in the jejunum. Okay. Uh, there are plicae, um, villi, and microvilli. This will make more sense when you can see it. Don't worry about these hormones, CCK and secretin. Uh, you'll get that in physiology. Lacteals, we talked about those last tests, and they absorb, uh, help absorb lipids and uh, fat, fat soluble vitamins. And don't forget, you got mucus and you got buffers in there to help neutralize that acid chyme. There's that word I just told you about C H Y M E. So here's your intestines, right? So the small intestines are divided into three parts the duodenum, and then this is called the jejunum, jejunum, and this part's called the ileum, the ileum. They're all three considered small intestines. Duodenum's not very long, it's about 10 inches. It's coming out of the stomach, remember the pyloric sphincter empties into the duodenum, and then the duodenum, it's kind of, I think it starts out a little bit retroperitoneal and then it comes into the peritoneal um, space or cavity, and then it empties into the uh, jejunum. And then the jejunum, of course, is connected to the ileum. The ileum dumps into the colon, and we'll get to all that. Um, okay. So these, this is a plica. We were just talking about plica. I've heard it pronounced plica or plica. I don't care. That's singular when it just ends in an A. When it's A-E, that's plural. Um, so those are foldings. You can see them with your eyes. They're pretty big. Um, and on those plica are uh, villi, and we've talked about villi, how they can have a lacteal inside of them, and the lacteal absorbs fats and fat-soluble vitamins, okay? Um, so, um, same four layers, right? So you got, there's your muscularis mucosa, so everything from there up, that's tunica mucosa. There's your submucosa. Here's two good layers of your tunica muscularis externa. You got the inner circular and the outer longitudinal. Don't go by which way these muscles are cut because it depends on which way you're looking at it, right? Whether they look long like this or whether they look like they're coming at you like that. Just know that the inner ones are called the inner circular and the outer ones are called the outer longitudinal. They're gonna give you different appearances on which way you're looking at the cut. So see the way when the muscle's coming at you, it looks different than when it's cut long ways. So don't pay much attention to that. All right, here's the colon. There's where the ileum dumped into the cecum. Remember the cecum is kind of like a pouch at the bottom of this uh, ascending colon. And so the, that's called the ileocecal valve. So sometimes I'll go, oh, and here's the anus would be down here. So that'd be the anal sphincter. Sometimes I go, name the four sphincters or valves that control the flow of food in order as it, it, as it becomes waste and goes out. So it'd be the first thing the food passes has to be your cardiac sphincter. Remember up there at the top of the stomach. Then it goes uh, pyloric sphincter. Then when it goes through all of this, then it'll go ileocecal valve and then it'll go anal sphincter. So sometimes I ask a little lecture, fill in the blank question like that. Don't forget your little, uh, there's your little appendix right there. Can you live without it? Oh yeah, you can get rid of that because it causes a lot of problems, <laughs> right? It's kind of a leftover organ in us, they think. They don't really know what it does. One of the theories is that some good bacteria can live in here and then if say you got you know, salmonella or whatever, and you had diarrhea and cleaned out all of your um, good bacteria got lost, you know, in the sickness, supposedly that can repopulate your gut with the good bacteria. Who knows if that's true or not, but that's the latest theory. 
Um, so make sure you know the segments, like that's ascending colon, or transverse colon, descending colon, the little curve here, that's the sigmoid colon. Then you got rectum, and then anus, and then out. These little pouches, boom, 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 those are called um, haustra, H-A-U-S-T-R-A. -A. If it's spelled T-R-U-M, that's just singular, you're just pointing at one haustrum, right? Um, so these are these little outpokings all around here. This little strip of muscle on the outside is kind of its own special little thing, right? And that's called the tinea coli. That should have a box around it. T-A-E-N-I-A -A coli. Tinea means worm. Looks like a worm. It's just a point name thing, right? Um, this flexure right here, I just call it the left um, flexure, left colic flexure in the right one. Uh, you can, if you want to get fancy, you can go, this is the splenic flexure, and that's a hepatic flexure. Uh, but it's just important, say you're doing a colonoscopy, you got to negotiate these terms and be real careful, because it's possible, you know, they could possibly perforate if they weren't careful, you know, as they try to go around that corner. It's very rare, but it, it could happen. Um, oh, and this is kind of nice, because it shows the mesenteric arteries. There's the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric, and it's showing how that's go into some of these um, intestines here. Um, and uh, they're flowing through mesenteries. They're not showing the mesenteries, but we talked about the mesenteries a while back. Um, so the valves, that's the ones we just talked about, right? So you got your uh, cardiac sphincter, your pyloric sphincter, your ileocecal valve, and then your anal sphincter. That's in order. Make sure you know the big parts. Make sure you know the... Uh, Calvary glands, you got the parotid, submandibular, sublingual, you got, those are all paired, you have them on both sides, right? Um, you have each of those on both sides. Here's the esophagus, right? There's the stomach, there's the small intestines, there's the large intestine, right? And then rectum, anus, and out, okay? Don't forget your little gallbladder, don't forget your pancreas, okay? Let's talk about the liver. This is spelled wrong. This should be B-R-E-A-K, or broken down. Toxins are broken down. Uh, Fat-soluble vitamins are stored in the liver also. Uh, about 25% of your blood uh, comes off the aorta uh, to feed into that, and that's where you get all your oxygen through that uh, little hepatic artery. You remember that comes off of the uh, celiac trunk. Uh, you know, the liver does a lot of things. It's got like 400 and something functions, but it helps break down the old damaged red blood cells, makes plasma proteins, does a lot of stuff, detoxifies stuff. Um, bile is synthesized there. Make sure you know that bile is synthesized in the liver and is stored in the gallbladder, okay? Um, that's just showing you your little hepatic artery. That's where most of your oxygen is coming from to your liver. There is a, a hepatic portal vein that's bringing in nutrients that have been absorbed from the GI tract. So it doesn't have much oxygen in it because it's a vein. So maybe 25% of your oxygen or so comes from there, but most of your oxygen comes from your good old hepatic artery. So the hepatic portal vein is nutrient rich, but low oxygen. Sometimes I ask a question about that. Uh, I can say, where's it bringing the uh, nutrients from? You go, digestive system, <laughs> or the blood from digestive system. That's what you don't want. That's cirrhosis. This is probably alcoholic cirrhosis, but other things can cause problems like this too, even hepatitis and, uh, you know, some uh, chemicals or drugs can do this. But uh, this is continued exposure to ethanol. And so this, this is not coming back. The liver is fairly regenerative. You know, it, it can kind of uh, heal itself if it's given the opportunity. But once it gets to this point, it's probably, probably too far, <laughs> too far gone. But they've even had people donate part of their liver, you know, like a father to a son or something. And they go back and they x-ray the father a uh, year or two later and the liver's completely grown back. So it's one of our few organs that can do that. It's pretty cool. Uh, there's the gallbladder. There's the duct that they call the cystic duct, the common hepatic duct, and those flow together to form the common bile duct. Okay. 
So why is it called a cystic duct? Well, remember this stuff was named long, long time ago. And when they'd look in the cadavers or when they'd do an autopsy, uh, they'd go, huh, everybody has a big green cyst. So naturally they call this the cystic duct, okay? Um, this is the common hepatic and I can go, the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct flow together to form the what? And it'd be the common bile duct. Notice why the common bile duct comes down here with this little um, pancreatic duct flow pretty darn close together in, into this little ampulla and uh, empties into the, uh, to the duodenum through this little papilla here. Well, that's kind of a bad situation because what if a gallstone has worked its way down and it gets stuck right here? It can block up your pancreatic duct. And then that can cause a problem called cause pancreatitis. It can cause some of these cells in the pancreas to die. And they're full of enzymes, remember? And so those enzymes, what do they break down? Biomolecules like carbohydrates, fats, uh, lipids, you know, stuff like that. And they can start digesting the cells next to them. Of course, that's going to kill those cells. And they empty out their enzymes. It becomes this positive feedback loop, and it can be very, very deadly used to have a mortality rate of about 25%. It's gotten better with newer therapies, but it's still a pretty dangerous situation. And a lot of times it's because a gallstone blocked it up. Sometimes though, it's from chronic alcoholic, alcoholism. Uh, that they're, they're real prone to pancreatitis. Uh, sometimes just weekend warriors, bingers can get it. You know, it's kind of sad. Uh, they're not what you would call an alcoholic, but um, somehow, you know, they'll go on a binge and that will induce pancreatitis. Pretty, pretty dangerous situation. Um, so there's your pancreas. Don't forget you got the little islands in there, Isles of Langerhans. They're trying to go to just call them pancreatic islets, which is fine. Um, and that's what makes your insulin and glucagon. So could I ask you about insulin? Yeah, just make sure you know it lowers blood sugar. Where does the blood sugar go? It goes into your tissue into your cells of your body where it's needed, right? Uh, so it causes, you know, your normal cells to uptake, you know, the glucose. Um, glucagon frees glucose up from, from where it's stored as glycogen in like the liver or the muscles, and it causes the glucose to be released into the bloodstream. So this is anatomy. Just make sure you know insulin makes the blood sugar go down glucagon makes the blood sugar go up, okay? Uh, all these other cells around it, these are called acinar cells. See the way they look like little cold sacs? That's called an acini, by the way. It's just a generic word. So that's why they're called acinar cells, A-C-I-N-A-R, I believe is the way it's spelled. Um, see, an acinus is the structure. Um, yeah, acinar. And, um, they empty their enzyme into these little ductules and these little ducts. And then um, that's the exocrine part. So these are digestive enzymes. So all of these cells, all of this stuff, that's making digestive enzymes where the, you can barely see the edge of a uh, Isle of Langerhans right here. That's making insulin. Remember, endocrine or uh, endocrine glands they don't have ducts, right? So you don't see any ducts. So they're ductless glands and they just empty their product into the interstitial fluid. The capillaries pick it up and shoot, brings it to wherever it needs to go. Where exocrine glands, they use ducts. So see the difference? This is good to have them side by side like that. There's our good old falciform ligament, right? There's our gallbladder. There's our cystic duct, hepatic, which is you know, this is a right and left hepatic. I'm not going to get that picky. And then there's our common bile. There's our pancreatic duct. So just make sure you can point those things out. Okay. Same thing here. Good old fast form ligament. Nice looking esophagus. They got this stretched out. It's not in the proper anatomical relation, everything. There's a fundus and a greater curvature and lesser curvature. So your greater omentum, lesser omentum are cut off of here. Right? You don't see them. You don't see your mesentery proper. That would be all in between here. Remember I said it's kind of like stretched in between your 
intestines, your small intestines. Um, so it's all gone off of here. So you can see the small intestines, right? You can see, oh, my cecum. See the cecum, how it's kind of way bigger around than the rest of the colon. And then there's an ascending colon, transverse, descending, sigmoid, rectum, anus, and out. There's a little appendix, pretty nice, right? Um, so anyway, I have used this laminate before just to point out the bigger structures. Here, you can see the file. See, they didn't draw it very well, but that's fast formal ligament, but it comes all the way over, <laughs> right? That's the lesser omentum. That's the greater omentum. This is a good place to point out them. Hint, hint. There's your mesentery proper. I don't like the mesocolon the way they did it, so no way I'm going to do that. Um, and you can see all this hangs down, so that makes it nice. So say then female gets pregnant, all that just gets pushed up, <laughs> right? It's mobile, it can move because remember you got all those serous membranes and everything slick and you know lubricated in there so things can, can move around, okay? And we'll talk about the reproductive stuff, another, another lecture. Right, no, not yet. This just showing you the way food goes through. Make sure you know all those parts and can pick them out. Um, we talked a little bit about amylase being in the saliva. I can ask you a question about that. And lipase is in the saliva too. And that can break down lipids or amylase. I'd rather you say starch, but if you say carbohydrates, it'd be fine. Pepsinogen is an inactive form of pepsin. So pepsin breaks down proteins. How do you activate pepsinogen? Well, you need hydrochloric acid. That's made by your parietal cells. So that causes the pepsinogen to be activated. That's why you gotta watch on some of your older patients. They may not be making enough hydrochloric acid. And so even though they're eating protein, they're taking in plenty of protein, it may not be getting broken down because they have low acid in their stomach. And then that low acid, um, isn't, you know, their pepsinogen is not getting activated, so they're not breaking down their proteins. Uh, the pancreas makes pancreatic enzymes that breaks down all of this, right? Lipids, carbos, proteins. Don't worry about the brush border enzymes, but they're little enzymes that are embedded in those cells in the intestines, and they break down the same stuff, right? Lipids, carbos, proteins. Uh, bile, make sure you know it emulsifies fat. It doesn't chemically break it down. So when I say emulsify, I just mean it takes a big globule of fat and makes it into a bunch of little globules of fat. They're not chemically broken down. Lipase chemically break it, breaks it down, <laughs> okay? Um, make sure you know that bile is made in the liver, but it's stored in the gallbladder. And we talked about which cells, you know, pepsinogen, or is made by chief cells, hydrochloric acids, made by parietal cells, <laughs> okay? Okay, that's just a cat. <laughs> you can kind of see, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see the mesenteries in between the intestines there. That's a drawing, of, I like this drawing actually. So this, the liver's kind of in little lobules. And so this, is a central vein that I'm pointing at, and it'll have these little triads, like six of them around the lobule, right? And the little triads, bonus question, what are they made of? A little hepatic artery or arteriole, a little bitty, uh, little bitty bile duct, and a little bitty, what they call a portal vein, right? Um, so, or venule, I guess you could say. Depends on how little it is. Um, so those are triads. They just call them hepatic triads. So if I say, what organ is this? You go liver. What is it? What am I pointing at? You go central vein. What are these three things? What's the structure called with these three things in it? You would go a hepatic triad, T-R-I-A-D. I might could do a bonus, name two or three of the vessels in a triad. Probably won't, but you never know. This is a triad. It's kind of hard to see the three, but they're in there. Um, that's a central vein. And it's just kind of nice. You see the way these little hepatocytes are, they're kind of like spokes of a wheel going out. Those are called hepatic plates. Probably not gonna get that picky, 
and the little spaces in between them they call sinusoids. So that's just the way it's arranged. Now you would have six of these. There would be another one here, here, you know, around. Uh, th this would be a lobule. You're kind of on the edge of a lobule here. This is human. A pig liver actually looks a lot better. I'll try to put one of those up on a review. That's a pancreatic islet. It's blurry, I know, but it's really nice because they kind of look like little ghosts. They look lighter compared to all these SNR cells around it. So this is what makes insulin and glucagon, and this is what makes pancreatic uh, enzymes. So this is exocrine part, and this is endocrine part. This is all pancreas. Okay, this is a uh, intestine, small intestine. It's not that great because our villi are kind of collapsed. This is the loom and this is a long cut, so the food would be going here. Um, but it's got a really nice uh, muscularis mucosa right there. It's got a really good uh, submucosa here. This is all tunica mucosa from here. Up. This is tunica submucosa. This is my tunica muscularis externa, my two layers, inner circular, outer longitudinal. And then this little cellular layer with a little bit of um, connective tissue stuff here, that's your tunica serosa. That's the serous membrane. Same thing as the visceral peritoneal membrane if you're on that part of the intestine. Okay. Um, that's just point name. Don't forget your uvula. We're not going to do hard palate. That was bone. Gum is just the gingiva. I guess we could do that. Um, tongue, don't forget. Sometimes I just point at something easy. What is that? Tongue. Um, same thing with uvula. Uvula, better view right here. So it just kind of hangs down in the back off of this soft palate here. I think it kind of functions in the gag reflex mainly. Um, I probably wouldn't do frenulum like this, a little lingual frenulum. Um, if it's too short, then that gives you, you, you probably heard of the term tongue tied. It makes it difficult for the little kids to speak. And then they can go in there and do a little surgery, a little laser scalpel and, and free that up. And then it's much easier to you know, pronounce things. Be careful if you're ever doing that surgery, don't cut into these. These are the openings of your submandibular ducts. You don't want to block those up because then this will swell up under here. It's a really dangerous condition if those get blocked up. Uh, it's called Ludwig's angina, if I remember right, and it can block the airway. I've actually watched them do a surgery on a little kid doing this, and they had to I think they had stones in them, if I remember right, and they blocked them up. So they had to go in there and unblock them. Uh, but it can that can swell up with saliva, you know, pushing everything up, and it'll uh, block their airway. So that can actually be dangerous. Um, that's a frenum also. I learned it as frenum. Your book calls it frenulum. It's just that little connective tissue. Orthodontists hate these because it can it can keep these teeth apart if they bring them together, <laughs> and sometimes they have to do surgery here to keep that from getting pushed apart. Um, there's your parotid, submandibular, sublingual. Don't forget you got, got those on each side. Tooth, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but just make sure you know the hardest stuff in the body, the white stuff here is enamel. This stuff is alive, the dentin. So if the dentist drills on the enamel, it doesn't hurt. You just feel vibrations. But when you hit down here, yeah, there's, you can feel that. You know, this has little neural projections in here you can that's alive in other words um this pulp uh cavity full of pulp tissue mainly blood vessels but there's some neural stuff in there too root canal this little hole is fair game that's called an apical from raymond probably won't do cementum but it's on the outside of a root and that holds the periodontal ligament to the alveolar bone right here uh and if you get periodontal disease then that can start this periodontal ligament can start getting destroyed and the bone level starts dropping. So that can loosen the tooth. Um, now, if you got a cavity and, you know, it started decaying and then the bacteria got into the pulp that can infect the tooth from the inside, and they might have to do a root canal and take all of this tissue out and fill it up with rubber. And then they'll probably have to put a crown or, you know, a uh, porcelain crown or a gold cap or something on top of that. Um, so anyway, all right. 
there's the there's the ones we talked about. And I think in one of my lectures, I can't remember if it was Queen Mac or Southwestern, somebody asked me, why do they call these eye teeth? Down south, they're going to call canines eye teeth. And I don't know, I think that's probably because the root is so long that it pokes up pretty darn close to the orbit, <laughs> right? And so I think that's where it got the name, but I can't swear to it, <laughs> okay? Um, don't forget the lesser omenum, greater omenum. Oh, here's a little hint. On the colon, I'll show you some better microscopes on another time. But if every other cell is a goblet cell, you're probably looking at colon. Yeah, there's goblet cells in other parts, you know, like of your, you know, uh, digestive system and respiratory system. But in the colon, it's a lot of goblet cells. And they make mucus, don't forget. So if you see, under your microscope, that's your big hint. If you see tons and tons of goblet cells, lots and lots, you're probably looking at colon. There's your fast-form ligament. There's your cystic duct in your gallbladder. And, oh, there's your hepatic portal vein. Don't confuse it with your vena cava. That's huge, right? This is your hepatic portal vein. Remember, high nutrient low oxygen here's your hepatic artery lots of oxygen in that that guy and then we're done okay so i'm going to put stop the chair and we're going to go end meeting okay that should be digestive two